Hi, hi, hi. How are you doing? Um, I just thought I'd do a live stream, as always, every week on a Thursday. So make sure you just put it in your diary. I'm sure you won't want to miss out. Um, as I've said on our recordings this week, we have reached, we're halfway to reaching our fundraising target. So anything that you can give to our GoFundMe page really helps. It ensures that we can produce our content and really, I think, start to actually amplify the voices of those in Britain, the silent majority, that just simply aren't heard, aren't given a hearing, a fair hearing, um, on any of our established media platforms. So please do consider donating if you can. And thank you for your continued support of the channel. It's I'm really grateful to you. You are amazing. As always, uh, comment along. I can see all of your comments and I'll aim to respond to some of them if I can, if I'm not gobbing off too much to be able to notice. I'm sure I'll be able to catch a few of your comments and respond to them. That's the good thing about this live stream, right, is that I get to actually interact with you guys and you are great. So I love doing it. Please do so. Um, you can comment on Twitter, YouTube, and uh, Facebook, and I'll see them. So, right. I want to start by talking about everyone's favourite former footballer. Gary Lineker. So, Lineker has done a video for the International Rescue Committee. Um, which is a refugee charity, basically. And in it, so the video caption says, Britain wouldn't be Britain without fish and chips. And you think, all right, fair enough. You know, we all do love fish and chips. Of course we do. But it goes on to say, basically lecture we're all on the little known history with Joe Brand and Gary Lineker of fish and chips. So let's just have a little Britain watch. It's not very long. Britain without fish and chips, a national institution, a culinary delight. Oi, Gary, have you ever thought about where I actually come from? Well, I suppose not. You've got refugees to thank for me. How come? Well, as it happens, I'm a bit Spanish, a bit Portuguese. 16th century Jewish refugees brought me over. Call that a history. We came over with French refugees, Protestants, I believe. Settled in the East End after we were chased out of France. Well, I never. Funnily enough, it was another refugee who decided to bring me and Fishface together back in the 1860s. It's true. A guy called Joseph Malin opened the nation's first ever fish and chip shop. What a history. Fish to re, Gary. Fish to re. <sighs> Ridiculous. Uh... Well, there you go. Uh, what are you doing? Britain wouldn't be Britain uh -uh. without refugees. No, 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 don't. And then obviously it ends with refugees as welcome. You know, sort of suggesting that everyone who's arguing about everything to do with the English Channel, about people trying to come here illegally, about being unable to police our own borders, that somehow we're some racist backwater that doesn't think refu genuine refugees are welcome, right? And trying to lecture us to make that point by lecturing us on the history of fish and chips. I'm really not sure what they're trying to get at in this video. You know, are they suggesting that nothing that has ever originated elsewhere can ever be claimed to be, you know, a, a much loved British produce or dish? Does that mean that first generation immigrants, for example, can never call themselves British? Where does this sort of thinking end up? Is it not inherently racist in itself? It strikes me as a really quite ignorant and narrow minded view from these so-called progressives like Gary Lineker and Joe Brand. I don't know what they're trying to get at here. And hardly anyone is making the case that we shouldn't have sympathy with genuine refugees. However, though, there are those of us who reckon it would be madness to do an Angela Merkel, you know, and open our borders, fling them open, say, all are welcome, come one, come all, and allow and encourage illegal forms of migration and actually encourage 
the people trafficking, you know, that evil trade of people trafficking. And as we see at the English Channel, you know, record numbers coming on an almost weekly basis now, that record keeps changing this year. And, you know, when it comes to Gary Lineker, th this video, these comments... They're, they come just as the new director general of the BBC is, is installed. And there have been reports that he's proposing new BBC rules that would prevent BBC staff from making political comments and statements on their social media channels. Now, Gary Lineker, you know, each year makes, what, over a million quid from the licence fee here? And... He reckons he can just lecture us on everything from Brexit to how ignorant and racist we are because we don't know that a delicacy that we all enjoy might not have originated on these islands. And none of that, of course, suggests that we should have open border policies or, or allow people who are breaking the law, let's not forget it's an illegal form of migration to come over here on a dinghy to break the law and gain an entry into this country. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm so bored of this hectoring. They won't even let we enjoy our fish and chips in peace without lecturing we on our privilege of, 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 you know, this idea that nothing good ever came from this country. We aren't worth anything here on these islands. All we are happens to be what we've stolen or been given by others. You know, just bore off Gary Lineker. What do you think? Let us know in the comments. Comment along on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. I'll be able to see your comments and respond to some of them. Um... I just, yeah, I, a lot of people are basically commenting saying, you know, I don't understand what Gary Lineker thinks he's doing in trying to lecture us on all of these issues. You know, it seem, it strikes me that a lot of the, what was once perceived as the magic of the BBC, where you had these commentators or um, BBC pundits, you know, news presenters, and we didn't know their views, you know, match of the day. I don't want to know your politics, I just want to know your commentary on football. I don't care what you think about fish and chips. You know, I just want you to give me political, uh, sorry, football commentary. And that strikes me as a problem with the BBC, right? Is that the illusion of these people being removed from politics, almost like the monarchy, because we are forced to pay for them with threat of prison if we don't pay the license fee you know we go through court etc etc and that surely is a massive injustice if at the same time they're allowed to be political commentators and lecture us on how ignorant and I guess in a way uh, prejudiced we are against refugees it's just so 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 wrong so hopefully you know, if the BBC, the new director general, actually does bring these people in line, I wonder if people like Gary Lineker will be able to make these sorts of statements and woke videos that are right on and lecture us all. Who knows? Who knows? Right. Next up, I want to talk about... Stephen Fry. Now, I just want you to watch this video. Hello there, I'm Stephen Fry. It's sickening how much money is being spent on think tanks and professional lobbyists to spread confusion, lies and doubt on the subject of man-made climate change. Now, whatever your view on climate change... And I don't think, by the way, the think tanks that he's talking about have actually ever sought to deny climate change. I think that what they've said is that the policy responses to it have to be thought out and well considered. You know, one, we can't 
bankrupt Britain in pursuit of this? Two, is it wise to bankrupt Britain when we are a 1%, maybe even less than 1% of global CO2 emissions? Whilst the likes of China booms ahead, spewing out CO2 at a rate of knots. <clears throat> and on Stephen Fry's attack on think tanks, <coughs> listen, I've worked in UK think tanks. And they run on tiny budgets with small but dedicated teams. Which is why it's astonishing to me. <coughs> I'm choking to death. That millionaires like Stephen Fry would stir up attacks on these think tanks. And what it's led to, I'll show you what it's led to. Look at this mob. So this is outside of a few offices of think tanks that are on the centre right. And I've got a lot of friends who work in this office, in particular in Westminster. And there's loads of really mad conspiracy theories about the power and influence that these think tanks have. But when someone like Stephen Fry, you know, says it's sickening and basically justifies, emboldens these activists outside of offices of people who are just, as I say, haven't worked in UK think tanks. The idea that just because he doesn't like their ideas, that, you know, you should stir up hatred of these places and basically embolden an angry mob to turn out outside the door. For me, it's the best argument in defence of donor privacy I've ever seen. <coughs> and I just wonder, looking at the way in which that Extinction Rebellion have been blocking roads again, when are we going to actually get tough on Extinction Rebellion? You know, the criminal damage that they've done here in that, uh, on my screen right now, you know, they threw red paint, they graffitied. When are we going to actually get tough on them? Uh, blocking ambulances from getting to hospitals, you know, gaining vital access to those needing their attention. The laws selectively applied to these middle class jobs break and rules on gatherings as well. You know, there was no special dispensation for anti-lockdown protests that were fined £10,000. I mean, my goodness, if Extinction Rebellion were fined £10,000 each time they did these sorts of things, we might be able to back make back the money that the taxpayers spent on police time and resources in trying to navigate these people from cause and disruption of the work and lives of many people who are trying to rebuild this struggle, our struggling economy and their own livelihoods. You know, I want to, why doesn't Stephen Fry tell Extinction Rebellion to get themselves away to China instead of attacking think tanks that probably make the same amount of money as a cost of coffee? You know, this is a country that has gone above and beyond in reducing its CO2 emissions. Just because you disagree with people doesn't mean you should send an angry mob to their doors. That's why it's so important that we have respect, freedom of association in this country and donor privacy. You know, CO2 spew in China can't say they've gone anywhere near as far as we have in the battle against climate change. Again, we account for like 1% of the world's CO2 emissions. China is responsible for more than the US and the EU combined. Why aren't they protesting over there? I'm sure all of us would chip in for their airfare, and I doubt you mind that they'd find such a tolerant reception in the Chinese police if they attempted to block access to healthcare and livelihoods in China. What do you think? Is Extinction Rebellion pushing it too far? Was Stephen Fry wrong to attack think tanks and basically embolden these activists to graffiti and attack the buildings and offices of these people who just disagree with Stephen Fry and Extinction Rebellion. It doesn't make them bad, evil people. Stephen Fry is an articulate man, should just challenge their ideas. Tell us why you disagree with them. Don't embolden these sorts of attacks on private property. Where does that get us? Nowhere. It's descending into a Marxist farce in which private property isn't cared for at all. They don't give a damn about private property. You know, as Emma Webb says on Twitter, 
They're trespassing on private property during a pandemic, surrounding an office in a massively packed crowd. And the police are just seem to be turning a blind eye to it because it's Extinction Rebellion. You know, just like Black Lives Matter, their politics are nice and you can't do anything about it. It wouldn't be politically correct to do so. So what do you think? Let us know in the comments. And if you haven't already subscribe to our channel on YouTube and consider supporting our GoFundMe page. We're halfway to our target. It's amazing. And we're almost at 40,000 subscribers on YouTube. Emma Webb, whose tweet I've got up here, she did a fantastic recording with Peter Whittle yesterday. That's on the channel that I uploaded yesterday. It's a great video, so check that out after you've watched this. Um, right, I'm reading your comments. Um... Simon Janey says, uh, oh, I cannot see your comment. Let's have a look here. That's better. Simon Janey. Am I getting your pr pronunciation of your surname right? Janey? Janney? Anyway, he says, can we crowdfund their airfare? I'd be delighted if Extinction Rebellion want to go to China and protest against their CO2 spewing ways. I'd be delighted to crowdfund for that. You know, that would be genuine, um, a genuine fight in the battle against climate change. Not like this country that's gone above and beyond. You know, we are almost putting forward policies that would bankrupt Britain in our pursuit of reducing our carbon footprint. We are doing more than most. Go to China. Protest there. Right. Now, the next topic. Now, this has got my back up a little bit today. I don't know if, if you have seen it. But it's... Did you watch Kay Burley this morning? Any clips? I'm sure you'll have seen clips. So, Tony Abbott, Kay Burley put it to Matt Hancock, who's the health secretary... That Tony Abbott is a homophobic misogynist, you know, listing off a lot of quotes from the Prime Minister's controversial views. And it says here, Matt Hancock, Hancock defended the former Australian Prime Minister and, you know, said, well, that he's an expert in trade. And, you know, Kay Burley kept putting it back to him for things that he said and it's sky news have got here a picture of pretty patel the home secretary with tony abbott from yesterday and good you know tony abbott was absolutely amazing in tackling australia's migration crisis right if we can rely and and go to him as someone who loves britain for expertise on how to solve that crisis, to stop the deaths, to stop the people trafficking, to stop the illegal forms of migration into this country that make it harder for those going through the legal channels to actually get here in a legal and safe way. Then if we can rely on a former Australian Prime Minister's advice on this matter, brilliant. But, you know, what are our 80-seat majority conservative government doing about this well they're contemplating bucking to the pressure of the bayon anti-conservative mob over the expected appointment of tony abbott to lead the uk's new trade board so in that role right he'd be helping to lead the uk's new freer trade aims in our new post brexit reality in which we seek to be the biggest agitator in boris johnson's words of freer trade and markets now tony abbott again like he did with the english channel crisis uh, sorry the australian migration crisis he successfully navigated both of those things free trade and the migration crisis in his time as prime minister now, the left-wing legacy gay press in this country have been running old Abbott quotes and punching him over his Catholic faith. And Kay Burley, as I say, did that this morning, which is in this article here. Now, she took the health secretary up on this and uh, questioned Abbott's suitability for the role, given what he said in the past. 
you know, conjuring with the, the label of homophobia, every single time when you disagree with someone, bringing up these accusations, these isms, the phobias, and, you know, over things which we view in modern society as a human right, LGBT+, plus whatever the other letters of the alphabet, alpha, alpha, alphabet, alphabet, alphabet there are now. You know, Abbott isn't some pride flag waving supporter or ally. Fine, I agree with that. But neither until recently were the likes of President Obama. Were he to make himself available as the UK's trade envoy, would our media take him to task on his one-time anti-gay marriage stance? And how about Bill Clinton, President Clinton, who passed the don't ask, don't tell legislation for the US Army? Would he be taken to task on his one-time anti-gay stance on policy? I don't think so. Of course not, because these politicians are left-wing. Tony Abbott is a conservative, so he must be resisted. Because to these people, it doesn't matter when it's the left. Sir Keir Starmer, he bashed, um, he urged the government not to hire Tony Abbott as a trade envoy in light of his opposition to gay marriage. So does he also believe that current sitting Labour MPs like Rosie Cooper, Mary Glyndon, Derek Twigg and Stephen Timms, who all voted against equal marriage in 2013, does he think they're homophobic as well? Of course he doesn't. Of course he would never say that because it isn't politically expedient for him to do so, for him to attack a conservative that's being put forward by the conservative party. And as Twitter user Matthew Lesh has suggested in this must-read thread that he posted earlier today, on a personal level, Tony Abbott is known to be courteous and kind to gay and trans people, as any common, decent human being would be. And Abbott's sister is a lesbian. And Tony Abbott went to that wedding to celebrate her marriage despite some claims on Twitter, and Catherine McGregor, who was at one point the world's most senior transgender military officer, spoke of the personal support provided by Tony Abbott when she came out. And there's no evidence to suggest, as, as Matthew Lesh has said, that he's filled with the kind of hate for gay people or women in the way in which you'd be led to believe he is, if you listen to our media today, the hyperbole coming from these people is hysterical. Tony Abbott is just a Catholic whose faith says that he doesn't support the evolving definition of what marriage means. And listen, I'm an Anglican. I go to church, the Church of England, and I know gay people in my church who don't support same-sex marriage either. They believe that civil partnerships should have been strengthened. Instead, do we assume all of these gay people to be homophobic and gay haters? Of course not. What Abbott absolutely was bloody well good at, actually, was standing up for Australia and ensuring that, as far as international trade's concerned, he was brilliant, and experts close to the UK government have made clear that having someone as expert as Abbott making the case for brand Britain at this unfrozen post-Brexit moment would be fantastic for the United Kingdom. You know, the Abbott gov government, his government, Australia, signed three major trade deals with China, Japan and South Korea. And negotiated loads more than that, which was signed after Abbott left office. But under Abbott's leadership, Australia's shining record on global trade was strengthened. And that's quite the difference to the protectionist and parochial stance we see made 
by the likes of Brussels. You know, we're seeing at the moment with the EU seeking to do all it can to keep the UK trapped in its regulatory orbit on level playing field provisions, on playing silly buggers over fisheries, for example, so that we are trapped in their regulatory orbit and we can't sign the kind of commercial deals that Australia championed under Tony Abbott's leadership. And as I say, you know, Keir Starmer's opposal, opposing Tony Abbott makes sense, right? Because two minutes ago, he didn't want the UK to leave the EU. He was doing all he could to ensure that we couldn't or didn't respect the, that mandate for the biggest vote for anyone or anything in British electoral history. So, of course, he doesn't want someone like Tony Abbott, who can make a success of Brexit, to lead the UK's charge in international trade around the world. Makes absolute sense to me. Don't know about you. Let us know in the comments. But as I say, Tony Abbott is a former Prime Minister of one of our friends, greatest allies, Australia, and a trade expert. And he's ideally placed. He loves this country and really wants us to do well and make the most of our post-Brexit future changing our economic outlook post-Covid. It's extraordinary to me that the government seems reticent to defend the proposed appointment. I've got this tweet here from Beth Rigby from Sky News. And Beth Rigby says that the PM spokesperson was asked whether Tony Abbott is a fit and proper person to represent the UK. And the spokesperson said, oh, no decisions on the Board of Trade have been made. Don't worry, Beth, you know. I know there is a political debate on this today, but I don't think there's anything I can add to it. How pathetic. You know, post-coronavirus, we need to be on the front foot as far as signing these commercial deals around the world are concerned. It's extraordinary to me that the government just aren't defending him. If, when we finally get Conservative voices into positions like the Board of Trade, and our government refuses to back them once the being hypocritical left-wing mob and the media comes for the scalp, having trawled through the internet for comments they've made in the past that have absolutely now to do with trade policy, which would be his only remit, let's not forget, what on earth did we give the Conservative Party an 80-seat majority for? You know, until the Conservative Party gets real about the left-wing Marxist march through our institutions and defends its own people, its own appointments, former Prime Ministers of Australia that want to do well for this country, that want to promote brand Britain around the world, that want this country to succeed in this post-Brexit moment, then we're going to continue down this path of seeing everything we stand for as a nation denigrated and potentially even destroyed. You can disagree with Abbott on gays. Listen, I'm a gay man. I personally supported same-sex marriage. But I still think Tony Abbott is ideally placed to represent this country in the international trading arena. I don't care what he thinks about same-sex marriage. I don't think it makes him a homophobic bigot. I don't think that 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 should somehow preclude him from being able to represent Team GB on the world stage. He's not homophobic. He's just a Catholic. Would any other religion be attacked in this way? I don't think so. I think it's grossly unfair, actually. And he's ideally placed, as I say, to represent this country. It's weak from the Conservatives not to defend him here. And in the words of Boris, you know, this government is acting like a supine jellyfish in its response to our ridiculous media's hyperbole today. Let me know what you think. Does anyone outside of the Westminster bubble care? If he can do the job, if Tony, do it, Tony Abbott can do the job and do it well, then let him get on with it, right? Let him ensure that this country does well out of Brexit. What do you think? Comment along. Let us know. I'm going to go through some comments here. Justin, my friend Justin says, 
Are you gay? Say it ain't so, Darren. Me, dear. Gay, dear. No, dear. Uh. Well, that's. I think this comment actually hits the nail on the head, really. Diane Easterbrook on YouTube. Hello, Diane. I hope you're having a good night. Diane says, the left want Britain to fail after Brexit, so are looking for anything to discredit a great appointment. And I completely agree with you, Diane. I think that's right. People like Keir Starmer, right, who have hated Brexit since day one, who did all they could, the establishment class, as part of the establishment class in this country, did all he could to ensure that Brexit couldn't go ahead. You know, teaming up with Burke, all the rest of it. Of course he doesn't want Brexit to succeed. So of course he doesn't want a great appointment like Tony Abbott, the former Australian Prime Minister, to be able to represent this country and make sure we do well on the international trading system out of Brexit. Of course that's right. I think that's a great point, Diane. More power to you. <laughs> Lisa Whitaker on Facebook says, I hope he's not related to Diane. I don't think he is related to, to Diana, but no. Probably because he can count. Boo Chalice on Facebook says, Tony Abbott, he must have offended Nicola Sturgeon. So sh she's having a go at him as well. You know, all the right people dislike Tony Abbott. You must be good. I think you've got a good point. Tony Brand says, who watches Sky News anymore? I think that was a good point as well, right? Watching Kay Burley just lay in to the health secretary when there's so much other content that she could take him up on as far as COVID's concerned, right? And many other things. But she chose to berate him over the perceived misogyny or homophobia of Tony Abbott. It just, their priorities are all wrong. That's why people are switching away from them, right? No one watches it anymore. As Tony says, you know, pro-woke, pro-left, anti-Brexit. I think you're right, Tony. Someone says, Tony Abbott is a great choice. He totally is. Totally is. Let's not forget all of the deals he signed, China, Japan, South Korea and others that were he partly negotiated that were then signed after he left office. I think he was brilliant for Australia. As someone who loves the United Kingdom, he could be brilliant for our country as well. More power to Tony Abbott. We've got a it's about time the Conservative Party got a backbone and stood up for its own. Otherwise, the left wing march through our institutions will just continue and the Conservative Party will have done nothing about it. Diane says, thanks, I'd marry you if you weren't gay. That's very kind, Diane. Nicola Perrin on Facebook says she's fast running out of support for Boris. Now, listen, I'm hearing this time and time again from people who voted for Boris and had such faith in him. And he did get Brexit done. You know, I was delighted. I was at number 10 on Brexit night. It was a marvellous occasion. And of course, we were all really happy after four years of an establishment stitch-up trying to do away with our vote. And Boris stood up for us and our vote, and he was brilliant. But I'm afraid he needs to stand up and be brave for conservatives and conservatism and this country and not allow those who want to denigrate our history, our culture, to do it any longer. Stand up for Team GB. Um, Max Power. I assume... He's cute would definitely bang. I don't know if you're talking about Boris Johnson, Tony Abbott or me. Interesting. <laughs> Aussie 93 says he'll marry us. Well, of course, 
same-sex marriages did go ahead. And I wonder, I'll invite, I tell you what, let's get married and I'll invite Tony Abbott. And I'll bet you he'll come. I bet you he'll come. Hopefully at that point, he'll be the president leaning, the president, he'll be on the board rather of our trade committee and leading the charge for Team GB around the world. Well, Angela says she's been conservative all her life and she's from Hartlepool, good lass. And uh, she's unhappy with the conservatives. And I, I listen, I, I agree, I am too. But I'm confident that, you know, Boris can find his feet again, use that 80 seat majority, put it to good use. You know, why are we not going ahead with things like the decriminalization of the license fee? Why haven't we done that already? And why should we have to pay for these people who, in their BBC proms decision, have made clear that they don't like this country? They don't like us patriotic bigots singing songs. You know, they've U-turned on that decision, but only after we all kicked off in good old fashion and showed what actually we can all do if we stand up, the silent majority stands up and makes its voice known. And I think actually Boris needs to recognise that that's happening more and more. You know, people are getting fed up of being taken for granted by our political media establishment, like the BBC, who just think they can denigrate everything that we hold dear. And I think with the BBC proms decision, we just said, no, we're not standing for that. And they had to U-turn on it. So, you know, now Land of Hope and Glory and Rule Britannia will be sang and good. This one thing that we have each year in which we feel pride in being British, pride in our history, pride in what we represent around the world. We're a great country. There's nothing shameful about saying that. So... I'm reading some of your comments. What have you got? Ah, uh, Bridget Blaine said, Love Jacob Rees Morgan. Today in the House of Commons, he sang Rule Britannia. A fantastic made my day. I, I'll i just play that for you because it. Bridget's right. It was amazing. In noting that the BBC are now going to broaden. Friend, join me in noting that the BBC are now going to broadcast Land of Hope and Glory as it should be heard. <laughs> After what could be described as a smokescreen set of excuses for their original decision concocted to mask yet another virtue signaling capitulation to political correctness, but I couldn't possibly comment, they have, <laughs> as they put it, reversed their decision. A description that in the context of anything to do with this government, they would characterize as a U-turn. Uh, can my right honourable friend think of any reason for this curious inconsistency? Uh, Leader of the House, hey, Mr. Speaker, I wonder. <laughs> Values of this house has just broken. How dare he? So Jacob Rees-Mogg actually broke a rule by playing Rule Britannia on his phone in the Commons. Mr Speaker, I of course apologise for any offence that I may have given to the House. But when Britain first at Heaven's command arose from the Azure Main, um, this was the anthem of the land and guardian angels sang this strain. Rule Britannia, Britannia rule the waves and Britons never, never, never shall be slaves. And let us hope that the BBC will recognise the virtues of Britannia in this land of hope and glory. Has he any more handout questions? We've got to be aware. Of. Can I now go up to Scotland with Carol Monaghan? And that was Joy Morrissey MP. She's an American. She's fantastic MP for Beaconsfield, which was Dominic Greaves' seat. Thank God Joy's in there. She's an absolute, you know, breath of fresh air in the House of Commons. But listen. I think, wasn't it great to hear Jacob Rees-Mogg speak like that? To actually, you know, speak quite fervently about what the BBC got wrong. About the BBC trying to denigrate these national anthems that we have so much love and pride for in. I wish all politicians followed Jacob Rees-Mogg's courageous stance and actually, with an 80-seat majority, spoke 
in defence of cultural conservatism, about defending Britain from those who don't wish us well. You know, Douglas Murray raised a really good point recently where he said, if you had a friend and you knew this friend loved you lots and wished you well, and this friend said to you, oh, I don't think you should do X, Y, and Z. You know, I think you're going down the right, wrong road here and gave you some advice and you knew they wished you well. You would listen to it more so than someone that you knew didn't wish you well. And Douglas explained that it's the same with the nation. If someone doesn't wish the nation well and actually would quite like to see Britain do bad because they think, Britain is an inherently evil, nasty place and we need to scrap our history and rewrite it and start all over again, then we shouldn't listen to these people. We shouldn't give them any more ammunition. We should reject their ideas wholesale and actually defend cultural conservatism and use that 80 seat majority, put it to good use. And Jacob rees is fantastic. Everything, the comments are flooding in. Francis, who is a lovely lad, um, he says, we should be proud of our great country. We're tired of people trying to destroy our history, good or bad. We move on and make Britain a better place in 2020. We've moved so far forward, further than many countries. Exactly. Why can't our conservative politicians be as clear about that as Francis is? You know, as proud as Britain's achievements, as Francis is, use that 80 seat majority, defend the good that Britain does in the world. You know, many, it, I was struck during Brexit just how many people were coming forward saying, you know, Britain will do really, world leaders, how well Britain will do post Brexit, because it's a great country. We are a great country. So Bridget says we should be a bit kinder to Boris because it's been testing times. And I agree with I agree with you, Bridget. You are right. So under the circumstances and with Boris being poorly and having a new baby, he's not done too bad. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. And that, let's not forget there's another four years at least of this government. But come on, you know, let's actually put in place some conservative policies. Let's defend cultural conservatism from those who I think during COVID have been more emboldened in attacking who we are as a nation, like you wouldn't believe, like never before. And uh, yeah, just I'd like to see a bit more from him. But you're right, Bridget, we should be a bit kinder but I'd love to see Boris being a bit more like President Macron, who's just rejected those who want to tear down our statues completely and said he's having no truck with it. And a bit of that French patriotism, I think we could do with an injection of that. You know, it, Peter Whittle, in my recording that you should check out on Reason's YouTube channel, he said that David Cameron was a prime minister that was ashamed of our flag. You know, he got rid of the flag from the Conservative Party's logo. And I think that was a real mistake because it suggests that we're sort of ashamed of our flag. And Peter explained that it might have been sort of post-colonial superiority and thinking, well, you know, the United Kingdom's flag is so brilliant that we can't boast of it. I'm afraid we do have to boast of it. We do have to boast of the good that it represents around the world. We do have to boast of the fantastic nature of the British people and our flag and everything, the good that it continues to do around the world. Because it's, I'm afraid it's under attack like never before. So the sort of patrician Tory, like Cameron's, needs to be rejected. We need Boris to be a bit bolder and prouder of what it means to be British. So, exactly. Alex on, I don't know, oh, on Periscope says, let's have the conservatism we voted for. I think that's absolutely right. Right, I tell you what, I'm going to call it a night because I'm starving. So, please do 
if you can, consider supporting our channel by donating via the GoFundMe page. We're over halfway to our target, which is fantastic. I'm so grateful to you all. We're almost at 40,000 subscribers on YouTube. If you've have got any ideas for content, interviews you'd like to see, leave us a comment, send an email, let us know, get involved. You know, I want to build this channel with you guys. Your support has been amazing. So let's keep on keeping on because boy, oh boy, do we have a fight on our hands at the minute. Cheers. Have a good night.